12th August, if it is their exam. If the examination is on uh, 11th or 12th, whatever. So time is very, very short. It would have been better if we could have organized this webinar much before. However, better late than never. I am quite sure that Dr. Rajiv will customize his delivery in accordance to the requirements of the students who will be appearing for the second semester CC code paper shortly. Now these are the words which are very formal. Let's be a bit informal. Welcome my young brother Rajiv. Amader A crash is not a very formal webinar because we try to address the needs of the students and we, when it is a delivery before the students, it cannot be something very much formal. Adore Shange Ode Kachuko Tapona Kora, Itayamadel Loko, Irageo Joko John Bulletin, Kutuko Sir, Ronjan Sir, Devashi Sir, Amra Shavai Cheshtakuri, Atu Chapri De Visheshoto Askeri Pandemic Police Tete Jokuntara. সব সময় সব টিচারকে কাছে পাচ্ছে না তাদের অনেক প্রশ্ন থাকে তাদের অনেক উদ্বেগ থাকে তাদের কাছে যে পৌঁছানোটা সেই পৌঁছানোটা কিছুটা হলো হৃদয়ে স্পর্শ থাকে তাতে তাই এটা যে খুব একটা ফর্মাল ওয়েবিনার সেরকম কিছু না इट शुड बी वेरी मच नियर टू दी हार्ट and down to the earth. <clears throat> this is perhaps the 15th program of Nilendu during the last one year. About 15 such programs are being organized in the interest of the students. And each and every webinar remained highly successful. And I'm very much confident that today's webinar will also be a very successful program because Dr. Raji is the speaker. I welcome all the students who are present here and I'm expecting that many more students will be joining shortly within the next 10 to 15 minutes. I welcome all the teachers who have attended from different colleges and it's still expecting that other teachers will also join. Uh, some of the teachers of my own college have also joined this webinar. I welcome them and with all these words of welcome, which are customary, now let us switch over to the real business where Dr. Rajiv Bhattacharya will address to the primarily to the students and also to the teachers. I hope his deliberations will be useful to all. Rajiv, you may go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nilendu, can I share the screen? Yes, sir. Hello. Ah, Shukrabach. So, respected principal, Professor Tilok Chatterjee of Bonkim Shankar College, teachers of the Department of Economics, other teachers from other colleges, students, and all other present in this webinar. I would first like to convey my heartiest thanks to the organizers, particularly Professor Nilendu Chatterjee and Professor Tilok Chatterjee for inviting me to speak on a topic, Mathematical Methods in Economics, Semester 2, 
Calcutta University syllabus. Now, this, as Professor Chatterjee pointed out, is a webinar which is different from the other webinars we, which we are familiar or accustomed to. Because I am also first time in this kind of webinar interacting with the students and I will try to provide a brief guideline to the students of how to go about, how to prepare themselves in mathematical economics to give their exams conveniently as Professor Chatterjee has told it, it will be held uh, around uh, 11 to 12 August. So less than one month is left. So uh, I don't know. I will try my level best. It's a different kind of uh, seminar or webinar. So I will try my level best to help the students uh, so that they can prepare it in a better manner. And my uh, presentation will be based on a PowerPoint one. It is it will be a PPT uh, prepared by considering the guidelines and the references as laid down by the University of Calcutta. And also I will follow the guidelines of uh, Professor Koushi Gupta, who, whom, uh, whose seminar or webinars, uh, where symposiums we have attended. All teachers have also attended, and he has laid down certain guidelines uh, according to which the uh, Calcutta University syllabus has been uh, uh, framed or modified like that. So basically, my my presentation will be based on the following references, which students can make a note of. It will be based on the, uh, the six to seven references which I have followed. When I emphasized on these references, there are other references also which you can go through according to the syllabus of the university. But fundamentally speaking, it will be AC Chiang, Mathematical Economics, and also the Chiang and Wainwright, the new book. It will be Sidester and Hammond, a very good book of Mathematical Economics, and also some part of Simon and Bloom. It is also uh, dependent on Henderson and Quant, Silverbach, and a uh, very good reference which Professor Koshi Gupto referred is Hoy and others, which I will come later on. And as you all know, students, I'm particularly telling to the students that it is not possible to cover each and every part of the syllabus within a short period of time. So what I have thought is I have tried to uh, 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 move into uh, my presentation in the following manner. So this will be my structure for today. So I don't know whether I will be able to give another uh, or, or, or college will permit me or time will permit me to uh, speak on another part because this is only the first part of the syllabus. If you go through the syllabus, there are actually four parts of the syllabus. One is concentrating on functions of variables, which we have seen in the screen. It concentrates Today's lecture is also uh, concentrating on, uh, I will try to throw some light on homogeneous and homothetic functions, the first important part. There are some typological errors, please excuse me. It will be concentrating on uh, Euler's theorem. Then comes the idea of level curves, the theory as it applies to the theory of consumer behavior and production. And on the second uh, unit, we will, uh, we will try, try to go deeper into the multivariable optimization part. Firstly, focusing on the first order and the second order conditions for optimization in a two and a three variable and a multivariable case. Then comes unconstrained optimization and then constrained optimization with equality constraints, the application of Lagrange multiplier method. Then comes the maximum value function and the envelope theorem. Last but not the least in this line is the Kuntakar conditions, you know, the inequality uh, conditions that we have in the syllabus. But the other things that we have in the syllabus, particularly I'm telling it to the students, uh, you have also a part on linear programming. You have also some models and some applications of difference equation. You have also some models and applications of differential equation. Due to time constraint, it is not possible to cover all those topics in a single day. I will try to throw some light on these issues, what, what I am showing in this slide. And if time permits, I say it with the permission of the principal, if I, I, I am also in the college, 
so having uh, the, 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 the the load of huge burden you to share the examination duties and other things so if time permits and uh, situation permits we may be able to have, uh, help the second part uh, of the lecture but uh, for the time being please be uh, uh, please uh, try to concentrate on the issues which i am showing on this slide and without wasting much time let me move on to uh, one by one of the topics let us see whether after this seminar after after this speech uh, i will try to interact with you whether you will uh, get uh, whether you have benefited whether you have learned something or whether some value added has been done to your knowledge as the exam is knocking at the door so let's move on so the first the first area which needs some important which is important and needs some focus is what about homogeneous and homothetic functions now in a two variable and in an n variable case the homogeneity or definition the homogeneous functions of the definition is given and the concept is being explained here now regarding reference in this part i would prefer Uh, the book by Sidester and Hammond, and also by Chiang and Wainwright. Any of the two references you can follow, and if, if you go through the references, you will find that these concepts are very easy to be understood. Now, what is a homogeneous? How do you define a homogeneous function for two variables? A function f of two variables, say x and y, defined in a domain D, is said to be homogeneous of degree k if, for all x, y in D. If we multiply each component by a factor t, which is greater than zero, that is f t x t y, it will turn out to be t to the power k into f x y for all t greater than zero. That means multiplying both variables by a positive factor t will multiply the value of the function by a factor t to the power k. The degree of homogeneity of a function can be arbitrary number; it may be positive, zero, or negative. now if we if we if it is asked to define in an n variable case how would you define suppose now you have a function in a n variable case x1 x2 comma dot 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 up to n uh, defined in a domain d and with t greater than 0 if you have f t x1 t x2 comma dot 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 t x n is equal to t to the power k into the function f x1 x2 comma dot 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 up to x n for all t greater than 0 then uh, we call this is homogeneous of degree k and the constant k can be any number which is positive zero or negative so this is the primary idea of what is a homogeneous function let us move on to the next slide now homogeneous functions of two variables or many variables actually are very much of interest to the economists why because the first thing that they do is they satisfy the euler's theorem of product exhaustion now uh, now now what about the euler's theorem now if xy if xy is homogeneous of degree k we straight away we can write x into first derivative first partial that is f1 dash xy plus y into f2 dash xy is equal to k times xy and it's very easy to prove if we differentiate totally differentiate the previous equation that we shown in the previous slide it turns out to be as uh, is shown in the uh, as is shown in this slide x into f1 into tx plus y into f2 uh, into ty is equal to k times t to the power k into fxy now putting t equal to 1 we can uh, get the identity and the euler's theorem can be easily done now this uh, uh, this important property some of the very general and important properties of a homogeneous function of degree k there are three basic important properties and this part you can see very well written in sidester and hammond if you go through the chapter on homogeneous function you will find that the three properties and the proofs very well and clearly done in the book so what are the properties now if a function fx is homogeneous of degree k then the first partials that is f1 xy and f2 xy will be homogeneous of degree k minus 1 a very important property and is is can be easily proved and fxy if it is it can be converted into par head or par capita form it comes out to be x to the power k f 
1 y comma y by x is equal to y k f x y comma 1 for all x y greater than 0 and also the second derivative part that is x square into f that if double dash f11 one one xy plus 2 xy f12 xy plus y square into f22 xy is equal to k into k minus 1 f xy for time constraint i could not show you uh, the proof if you go through the i am telling you the reference if you go through the book by sedester and Hammond, you can very well find this clearly and uh, explicitly done in the book now rather i have taken an example what is the, what is the example showing if you are given a question like this, that you are given a function in the examination, say f x y is equal to 3x square y minus y q, and you are asked to show that starting from the Euler's theorem and the three additional and the three additional properties which I have just now stated, you are asked to prove all those three additional properties with the help of this specific function. So what you have to do, you are first to find the first order partial, first partial derivatives with respect to x and with respect to y as it is done. F1 dash xy is equal to 6y and F2 dash xy equal to 3x squared minus 3y squared and multiplying each of the first partial derivatives by their corresponding values of x and y, you get 3 into f x y that shows that the degree of homogeneity is 3 it confirms and it is homogeneous and it is it satisfies the Euler's theorem now uh, if you if you if you go to the other parts as it is done uh, it's not possible to go and read out all those it's done in the book and it's done in the slide if you can if you want to go through it's also the polynomials you can see the first um, that is par first partial f1 dash and f2 dash are also homogeneous of degree 2 it's easily confirmed so property 3 is already proved and three, uh, property 4 and 5 is done uh, you can you can easily put the values and confirm that all the uh, three additional properties can be easily fulfilled so you may be directly may not be given a question fxy but you may be given a specific function like this or any other function like 3x square y as i have shown minus y cube this example is also worked out in the sedester and Hammond. if you go through the example you can easily understand all those properties which i have just now pronounced now let us come to another very important property of a production function which where the application of this homogeneous function is done. If it is homogeneous of degree 1, we can show that the, 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 the production function involving capital and labor, if it is homogeneous and of degree 1, we can show that output labor ratio, that is y by L, is a function of the capital labor ratio, that is uh, k by L. Later we will see that this k by L, this is very well used in the later part if you if you have the solo model when you read the solo model you, you will see that this par capita form is used in the neoclassical type production function so if you go through the detail of this par capita form you will understand say if you take a cop Douglas production function if you take a is equal to k to the power a l to the power b suppose you are having a linearly homogeneous part that is a plus b is equal to one you see, it's, it can be very well proved as, as, as the solution shows, as it, as it is homogeneous of degree 1, each f, each component of capital F k L is multiplied by k into L. And it turns out to be L into f of small k. And when you put the values, it turns out to be f of small k is equal to a into small k times uh, to the power a. And the small k is nothing but the capital labor ratio. So you can see the, 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 the out, output per capita can be expressed very easily in the form of a capital labor ratio. So this is a very important property which follows from the homogeneity. So you can go through the book and you can see the various other properties of Cobb-Douglas production function, linearly homogeneous. There are many, many properties and also the CES production function. There are many applications due to paucity of time. I, it's not possible to show all of them. Now, if you are asked, it's a simple question that uh, the, let's take the previous example again. F x y equal to 3 x square y. Uh, minus y cube and you are asked to show that prove that the degree of homogeneity is 3 how to do just you multiply each of the component by a factor t you see that it turns out to be t cube into x y so suppose that means if t is equal to 2 that means 
all the inputs or all the components are doubled, it comes out that the function is multiplied by h, that is 2 cubed, that is h. So after doubling x, y, the value of the function increases by a factor 8. So that shows how can you easily compute the degree of homogeneity of a function. Now let us prove it in a more formal way, how to prove the Euler's theorem for, uh, n, uh, um, n, uh, for a function of n variables. Say we have f x1, x2, comma, dot, 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 up to xn is homogeneous of degree r. So you are asked to prove that the Euler's theorem says that del f into del x1 into x1, del f by del x1 into x1, uh, plus del f by del x2 into x2 plus dot, 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 del f by del xn, that is each partial derivative with respect to the variable multiplied by that factor. If you go on taking the sum of all those, that turns out to be degree of homogeneity times the function. So you are asked to prove this. So how to prove? Now the proof is very simple. By the uh, property of homogeneous function, we know that if you multiply each component by a factor t, that is f t x1 t x2 comma dot 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 t x n, that will turn out to be equal to t to the power r f t x1 x2 comma dot 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 x n. That means uh, 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 this, this is an identity which holds for any value of x1 x2 comma dot 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 x n and also any value of t. So we differentiate both sides with respect to t. But remember, for the students, I am saying that f is a function of tx1, tx2. So it cannot be directly differentiated with respect to t. So what you do is you, you differentiate f with respect to tx1 first, then differentiate tx1 with respect to t. So you continue this and find this line that is del f del tx1 into del tx1 by del t and continue like this. And the right hand side turns out to be r into t to the power 1 into f x1 x2 comma dot 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 xn. However, del t xi by del t, as we all know, that turns out to be equal to xi. So substituting these values, you get del f by del t x1 into x1 plus del f by del t x2 into x2 plus dot 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 del f by del t xn into xn turns out to be r into t to the power r minus 1 uh, f x1 into f x1 x2 comma dot 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 xn. As we all know that a t can take any value, so putting t equal to 1, we get the Euler's theorem that is del f into del x1 into x1, del f by del x1 into x1 plus del f by del x2 into x2 plus dot 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 del f by del xn into xn is equal to r times the function. So it can be proved very easily. Now, let us consider a Cobb Douglas type production function, which is an application of this, uh, which can be, which can help us understand this uh, 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 Euler's theorem in a better manner. So it is of the form y is equal to l to the power alpha k to the power one minus alpha. You take the marginal product that is uh, f l and f k, the first partial derivatives with respect to l and k. That are as it is shown uh, it, that uh, you, now you multiply each fl and fk by their corresponding values that is fl into l plus fk into k and then uh, take an addition take a sum of that now it turns out to be is equal to y so that means it shows that if each factor is paid according to its marginal product because you will uh, you know it by production function that fl and fk are nothing but the marginal product of uh, a production function with respect to labor and capital so if each factor is paid according to its marginal product the total product will be just exhausted so it is also giving you the product exhaustion theorem as far the cobb douglas production function homogeneous of degree one here now let us move into with with this background let us move into what is a homothetic function now if you have a function of n variables x uh, which has x1 x2 comma dot, dot, dot xn defined in a cone k then f will be called homothetic f xy belonging to k f xy is equal fx is equal to fy and t greater than 0 implies ftx is equal to fty that means that means if suppose f is a consumer's utility function then what does this equation convey 
it means that there is if there is indifference between two commodity bundles x and y and if both are increased by a proportion t or both are shrunk by a proportion t they will also remain indifferent that means if the consumer is indifferent between 2 liters of soda or 3 liters of juice he is also indifferent between 4 liters of soda and 6 liters of juice that means all has to be magnified and all has to be shrunk by the same proportion that means if you go through a line straight line through the origin the ratio remains constant so the, the mrtslk or MRS, mrs uh, xy in case of consumer behavior they remain constant in case of homothetic functions now it this uh, this a uh, very important property of a homogeneous homothetic function in relation to homogeneous function is uh, a homogeneous function f of any degree k is homothetic but the converse is not true i tell you you can go through the book by Sidestan and Hammond as from that I'm uh, telling you this part. It's very easily proved. How to prove that? Now, let us take the more general result. Suppose capital H is a strictly increasing function and F is homogeneous of degree K. You take F, capital F function of X to be written as H function of small fx, which is homothetic. So fx is equal to fy equivalently means capital H small fx is equal to capital H function of small fy. So strictly increasing means fx is equal to fy and it is homogeneous of degree k and t greater than zero. So if we extend it, so capital X, if we multiply each component by a factor t, so tx is equal to h. So each component multiplied, so small f uh, tx is equal to as degree of homogeneity is k. So you have h t to the power k fx is equal to h t to the power k fy is equal to f uh, h f t y is equal to f t y. So it easily proves that the function homogeneous of degree k is also homothetic. Now, the more familiar form, which the exam related forms, which we come across in the exam, the very questions which we come across in the exam, I've tried to take up some examples and calculate in my own. This is not done in the book. This is I have done to mathematical equation software, which we use normally for the research part. Uh, I have tried uh, to take all the pains to write it there and present it to you so that you get familiar with the not only from the parts which are drug, which are only given in the uh, books solved, but also from those parts of the CU questions, which you normally come across in the examination. This is a very familiar question which we have. Why suppose you are given a production function y is equal to alpha log x1 plus 1 minus alpha log x2, which is homothetic. You are asked to show that it is homothetic, but not homogeneous of any degree. It can be very easily shown. See, you take up, you start from the production function y is equal to alpha log x1 plus 1 minus alpha log x2. You increase each of the component by a factor t. So you have y star to be turning out to be equal to y plus log t, which is not equal to t to the power y, t to the power r into y, not the form which you are supposed to have in a case of a homogeneous production function. So we can very easily from this connote that this production function is not homogeneous of any degree. Then what is our next task? You find the total differential of y. So you take, so it, it will be al alpha by x1 into dx1 plus alpha 1 minus alpha by x2 into dx2. So you take the first partial, del y by del x1 and del y by del x2, you take the derivative, take, uh, take the ratio of the two, that is, that will give you the slope of the isoc1 dx2 by dx1. And you, it turns out to be alpha by 1 minus alpha into x2 by x1. And you can see that the slope of the isoc1 remains unaffected by changes in x1 and x2 by a factor t. Therefore, the slope remain, of the isoc1 remains constant along a ray through the origin. And so, as I've already explained to you, that this production function is homothetic. Let us move on to the next one. Let us come to the concept of the next part of uh, uh, sub part, what I have already shown you, that is the concept of a level curve. And for this, I will follow the reference with what Professor Koushi Gupta has referred to us, a very good book by Hoye and others. If you have a PDF of that book, you can go through this part, it's very well written. Now, level curves, which basically means at a level, means 
fixed at a particular level fixed at a particular value that means if you have a function y f function of x1 x2 the set of all pairs of x1 x2 that will generate some specific value of y say y bar is called a level set and if in a two variable case you can solve the equation explicitly for of x2 in terms of x1 for a fixed value of y that turns out to be the equation of the level curve in x1 x2 space with assumed to be a fixed value of y now the derivative x2 by x1 is then the slope of the level curve but there are certain problems in computing it in this manner so the alternative method is the total differential approach the advantage of this approach is it can help us solve very complicated problems in and explicitly and very easily so unless you start off with a function y is equal to f function of x1 you put the value uh, or, or a bar on the y because it is at it is fixed at the level y bar and take it on the uh, uh, on the uh, all to the um, um, right hand side so you have f x1 x2 minus y bar to be equal to 0 so put it in a function capital f x1 x2 and write it in the form f x1 x2 minus y bar take the total differential that is df is equal to f1 dx1 plus f2 dx2 equal to 0 for fixed y that means if you calculate dx2 by dx1 at y bar or dx2 by dx1 at dy is equal to 0 it turns out to be minus of f1 by f2 so the condition y is equal to y bar or dy equal to 0 is an explicit recognition of evaluating the derivative at dx2 by dx1 specifically along the level curve for a value of y which is fixed at y is equal to y bar or in other words the value is not changing that means dy is equal to 0 so it is written uh, uh, um, uh, that y is equal to y bar and dy equal to 0 with that uh, derivative dx2 by dx1 now let us move on to some examples of level curve the very easy uh, example which can be constructed is say z equal to x square plus y square we all know that this represents if we uh, uh, represent it in a in a form of level curve they represent circles because x square plus y square equal to c with c greater than 0 with the radius of the circle being root c if we take various values of c say 1 2 as it is shown in the diagram we get levels same levels of radius giving you a circle so uh, if we if we uh, consider only examples outside the economics you can think of an example uh, like uh, a circle uh, in a level curve now let us come to uh, the the most common and familiar examples of isoquants now isoquants iso means same and quant is the short form of quantity which tells you that along a particular level uh, along a particular isoquant the level of output remains fixed so all combinations of k and l that gives you a fixed level of output say y f function of k comma l with uh, y is equal to y0 constant gives you a level curve so if you have a set of isoquants giving you as isoquant map as it is shown in the diagram with if 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 you fix the level at y equal to say c1 say c2 say c3 you get various levels of isoquants similarly the if you apply this theory to the theory of consumer behavior you get a set of ics because at various levels uh, you various combinations of the two goods that is capable of giving the same level of utility also gives us a level curve in the consumer behavior that gives us the indifference curve or the indifference map now let us take uh, this example i will not going to i am not going to discuss in detail so if you are given a question like this say take a general example f x1 x2 is equal to very simple 2 x1 plus 3 x2 and you are find you are asked to find the slope and draw the level curves so how to do you take a total differential and you find that dx2 by dx1 at dy equal to 0 is equal to minus 2 by 3 so the, it's a straight line because the slope is constant and negative so you draw a slope uh, you you draw a curve and take various values of y y15 y25 y35 they will move parallelly so this represents a level curve of y uh, is equal to 2x1 plus 3x2 in this plane now let us move on to our second part second unit of the presentation so let us uh, so i have completed in a uh, 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 very fast speed i have tried to complete because i have many things to cover 
I don't know whether time will permit me to cover all those. And uh, uh, due to uh, the bad weather, I'm trying to cover up. Let's see whether I can help the students. So that's why I'm trying to cover things in a little bit faster manner. So let us come to what is optimization. We all know optimization is basically meaning the maximization or minimization of a function over a given set. Now, there are two kinds of optimization. One is unconstrained and another is constrained. Now, if we focus on unconstrained optimization, uh, uh, that is, um, say, twice different, you take a function which is twice differential, well, and this unconstrained maximization problem tells you that you can, uh, it's any point in R to the power n is allowed to be a possible solution. Now, let us concentrate for the time being, without, before going to the multivariable case, let us concentrate on what is a single variable optimization. We define an extreme value that is the maximum value or the minimum value of a function which is nothing but the stationary value also so if it is if, if fx has a domain d then suppose that a function f is differentiable in the interval i that c is an interior point of i for x is equal to c to be maximum or minimum for f in interval i a necessary condition is that that for the function uh, f x is equal to c satisfies the that is it has to be a stationary point it has to satisfy the equation f dash is equal to zero that is the first order necessary condition for uh, 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 for an extreme value so if we want to test the maximum or the minimum considering the uh, first order necessary condition what you have to do is if f dash x greater than 0 for x less than equal to c and f dash x less than equal to 0 for x greater than c then x is considered to be maximum point if f dash x less than 0 for x less than equal to c and f dash x greater than equal to 0 for x greater than equal to c we have c to be the minimum point that can be easily checked by the first derivative condition test for maximum and minimum now let us come to what is there in this syllabus. So you have a function of two variable case. And as you can see, it's very well written that you can go through the chapter from Chiang or Chiang and Wenwright that will help you to do uh, understand the things much better. Now, let us take a function z equal to f function of x comma y. What is the first order condition? The simple first order condition is dz equal to zero for arbitrary values of dx and dy, not both zero. So dz is nothing but fx dx plus fy dy. So the first order condition turns out to be fx is equal to fy equal to zero. That is del z by del x equal to z del z by del y equal to zero. Now what is the second order condition? The second order condition for maximum is d2z less than equal to zero and for minimum d2z greater than it if you convert it into fx and f um, second derivative condition with respect to x it turns out to be f double dash less than zero f uh, fxx less than zero fyy less than zero and fxx into fyy greater than fxy square because you know from the young's law fxy is just equal to fyx so uh, in case of minimum, you have x, f, x, x greater than zero, f, y, y greater than zero, and f, x, x into f, y, y greater than x, f, x, y square. And in this table, which is given below, you have the same thing written here. So in case of maximum and minimum, the first order conditions are same, but the second order conditions differ slightly because that f, x, x and f, f, y, f, y, y, both are negative in case of maximum and in case of minimum, they are both positive, but f x x into f x uh, y y greater than f x y square is the same in case of both maximum and minimum. Let us move on to the next one. Now, if you have an objective function with more than two variables, say z is equal to f x1, x2, comma x3. So what is the first order condition same dz equal to zero so it's, uh, dz equal to f1 dx1 plus f2 dx2 plus f3 dx3 that means f1 is equal to f2 equal to f3 equal to zero so what is the second order condition? now the second order condition will be uh, uh, having a little bit slight change we will have something called the symmetric hessian determinant it is of the form that it has three rows three columns and uh, the, the, the second uh, derivatives, that is f11, f12, f13 in the first row, f21, f22, f23 in the second row, f31, f32, and f33 in the third row. 
So uh, if we take the uh, successive principal minus, that is H1, it is F11, H2 is, is F11, F12, F21, F22, and H3 is nothing but H. So uh, for maximum, the condition is H less than uh, H1 less than 0, H2 greater than 0, H3 less than 0. And for minimum, you have H1 greater than 0, H2 greater than 0, H3 greater than 0. And if you take a very simple example, it will be better for you to understand. So let us take Z is equal to 2X, say any example. So I have taken an example 2X1 square plus X1, X2 plus 4X2 square plus X1, X3 plus X2, uh, X3 uh, square plus 2. Now, as you can see, the first derivative turns out to be first derivative, second derivative, and uh, um, that means F1, F2, and F3, uh, setting all those equal to zero, the first order condition turns out to be X1 bar equal to X2 bar equal to X3 bar equal to zero. So uh, it has a stationary value at Z equal to two, but whether the stationary value is, uh, is maximum or minimum that you have to check. For that, you take the uh, second partial derivatives, that is F11, F12, dot, 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 F33, all those, put those in the Hessian determinant, find it the value, you see, you check that H1 is equal to 4, H2 is equal to 31, H3 is equal to 54, you see, all are positive, that means, that means Z is equal to 2 is minimum, because the condition already, as you can see in the screen, is all the uh, successive principal minus has to be positive in case of minimum. So here it attains z equal to 2 is minimum. Now let us come to with application of this. We can uh, have a, a little bit uh, concept of concavity and convexity. It's uh, um, easy to understand if you draw diagrams, and this is the book by uh, Chiang and Chiang and Wainwright. If you go through the book, you will understand it easily. Set so let u is equal to u1, u2, and v is equal to v1, v2, v2, two distinct ordered pairs, two vectors in the domain z equal to f x1, x2. So the values of z, z values, uh, uh, the height of the surface, you can see the height of the surface, Corresponding to values now uh, will be f u is equal to f u1 u2. You can see f v is equal to v1 v2. So a function will be concave if and only if any pair of distinct points u and v in the domain f for theta 0 less than theta less than 1, the height of the line segment must be less than equal to the height of the arc. That is, what is the height of the line segment? You express it in the form theta f u plus 1 minus theta f v less than equal to theta f theta u plus 1 minus theta f v. And in case of convex, the theta f u plus 1 minus theta f v will be greater than equal to the height of the arc f of theta u plus 1 minus theta v. So you have correspondingly three theorems which directly follow from this uh, rule of convexity and concavity. There are the three theorems are like this. Now, uh, case of linear functions. If fx is linear, that means it is concave as well as convex, but not strictly so. Number two, uh, the negative of a function. That is, if fx is concave function, then minus fx is a convex function and vice versa. Similarly, if fx is strictly concave function, then minus fx is a strictly convex function and vice versa. And what is the third theorem? Sum of functions, that is, if fx and gx are concave or say convex function, then fx and gx, fx plus gx, that is the sum of the two, will be concave or convex function. If fx and gx are both concave, or convex in addition either one of them are uh, one or both of them are strictly concave or strictly convex then fx plus gx is strictly concave or strictly convex okay so now the same thing i'm not going to repeat the same thing is done in sidester hammond but in a different notation with a different notation if you go to the Sidester and Hammond part, you will see that the same thing is done, but in a different, with a different notation. So first order condition and the second order condition is being expressed. And if you are given a question like this, say you have C, you have a farm producing two commodities A and B, and the daily cost of producing X units of A and Y units of B is given. Okay. See, the price per unit of A is rupees 15, 
and price per unit of B is rupees 9. So if you are asked to find the optimum values of X and Y that maximizes the, 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 the profit of the firm. So what we will do? You put it into the profit function. You know profit is the difference between revenue and cost. So uh, the revenue part is 15 into X plus 9 into Y as 15 and 9 are the price of X and Y. So uh, and you uh, from that you deduct the part of the cost function. So after that you find the first order condition that is d pi by dx, del pi by del x and del pi by del y put them equal to zero. You get x to be equal to 100 and y to be equal to 300. But that is not all. You have to check as it is not done here, but you have to check it at home. What to do? You call say pi del pi by del x equal to pi say x and del pi by del y equal to say pi y. And then you also find pi xx, pi uh, xy and pi yy. And you try to satisfy the condition that pi xx into pi yy greater than equal to pi xy square. That is the uh, other second order condition that you need. And also that uh, del pi by del x, uh, uh, pi xx and pi xy to be um, um, less than zero. So if you get those conditions, you will see that uh, you have satisfied the con second order conditions for maximum also. So uh, uh, that means the profit is maximum, not minimum that can be checked only by if you calculate it from the second order condition. Similarly, if you have a function like uh, so this kind of general function, you can also calculate it from the uh, second order. You first try it uh, from the first order condition, set it to be equal to zero. You get the solution to be five and eight, and then find the second order condition, put it into the uh, equilibrium second order condition, the conditions that is stated already, and check whether it is maximum or minimum. So second order condition helps us to check convexity, concavity, maximum, minimum, and all those. We can also have the second order condition for convexity convexity as you know from the Slutsky equation also uh, the, 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 the convexity of the indifference curve or the convexity of the isoquants can also be verified by using the second order condition. Now this is, the, uh, this is a part related to the unconstrained maximization as I have already told you I will say some few words about the unconstrained. So profit if you are given a revenue function and a cost function like this and you are asked to find the um, um, uh, profit and the uh, output, uh, equilibrium output, how to find? So you put the revenue and the cost function, uh, set the first order condition that is d pi by dq equal to zero. You have a quadratic function. So you have two roots, q is equal to three and 36.5. And you check from the second order condition d2 pi by dq square, where one uh, with q equal to three, it turns out to be greater than zero and q less than three, it turns out to be less than zero. That means the second order condition is satisfied when q equal to 36.5. That means putting 36.5, you get the maximum profit to be given as here. Okay. So you can have an unconstrained maximization though the constraint is not stated. So you can just maximize it by the first order and check it by the second order condition. A very familiar example in relation to this is, suppose you are given a cost function a q q plus b q square plus c q plus d. So the question is, uh, this is, um, uh, you can find this example in Archibald and Lipsey. I told you there are different books. I forgot to mention this one in the very beginning. It's a very good book where you have an example. What sign restrictions on ABCD can make it a cubic function? So you have first, you have to calculate MC, MC has to be positive. Now MC is 3AQ square plus 2BQ plus C. And for MC to be having a relative um, 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 minimum uh, above the origin, you set D, DQ of MC to be equal to zero. You find the output level Q star to be minus of B by 3A. Now already you know from the uh, first condition that uh, uh, MC has to be positive, you need the coefficient of Q squared term A, that is uh, A has to be positive. Now if A has to be positive, now in Q star you have minus B by 3A. Now Q star in order to have Q star to be positive, A is positive, 3 is positive, so B has to be negative. So B has to be negative, me, otherwise uh, Q star will become negative. So now, after finding those, you put the value in the MC minimum, you see that it turns out to be 3AC minus B square by 
3a so if uh, it has to be if, if this has to be positive you need b square less than equal to 3ac that gives you c greater than 0 and d is the fixed cost and if considering d as the fixed cost you get the condition a c d to be all positive and b less than 0 and also the condition b square less than 3ac so these are some of the applications which you can go through the book to find the, the derivative of the first order and the second order conditions. Now coming to optimization with equality constraint. A very important part of the syllabus is the application of what is known as the Lagrange multiplier method as you all must be knowing that if you have a utility function say u equal to x1 x2 plus 2x1 subject to a budget constraint say 4x1 plus 2x2 equal to 60 you put it in the Lagrange objective function that is which incorporates both the objective function as well as the constraint and you set the first order condition partial derivatives with respect to x1 x2 and lambda to be equal to zero and after finding those you can find the, the value optimum values of x1 x2 uh, from those conditions similarly you have if you are given a function like z equal to xy and a constraint fx uh, x plus y equal to six from the first order conditions you can find the values of uh, x x y and lambda and stationary values can be easily tested from the uh, second order condition whether it is maximum or minimum so if you have a condition like a utility maximization general case u x y which is a plus lambda into b b is the amount of money income uh, minus x into p x plus y into p y which is the budget constraint written in the bracket so in the case of lagrange multiplier you set the first order partial derivative zx zy and z lambda to be equal to zero the second that that gives you ux by ui is equal to px by py is equal to lambda so in case of second order condition what you do is you go by the bordered hessian determinant and for a sufficient condition you re for relative maximum you need h to be greater than equal to zero greater than zero and uh, for minimum you need h to be less than equal to zero you can see also the convexity condition can be written in the form as 2px py into uxy minus py p square into uh, py square uh, into uxx minus p x square uh, into u y y greater than equal to greater than zero so now let us come to a, con a, a concept called quasi concavity and quasi convexity now what is quasi or quasi convexity or concavity a function f is quasi concave if for any two distinct pairs u and v in the domain uh, f uh, for zero less than theta less than one f v greater than equal to f u implies f of theta u plus one minus theta v greater than equal to f u and in case of quasi convex if f v greater than equal to f u you have f of theta u plus one of uh, one minus theta f uh, v um, to be greater less than equal to f v so in case this case also there are th three theorems the negative of a function that is if f x is quasi concave uh, you have minus fx to be uh, um, um, uh, strictly uh, quasi-convex, um, sorry, it's not strictly, uh, quasi-convex. Theorem 2, concavity and convexity versus, so any any concave function is quasi-concave, uh, uh, but the converse is not true. Any strictly quasi -con uh, strictly concave function is strictly quasi-convex concave but the converse is not true similarly we can state the same conditions in terms of quasi convexity and in case of linear functions if fx is a linear function then it is quasi concave as well as quasi convex now let us come to what is the maximum value function of the envelope theorem now the maximum value function is nothing but the objective function where the choice variable have been assigned the optimal values so after optimizing a particular say um, uh, uh, through the Lagrange multiplier you find x1 star x2 star and putting it into the utility function what you have is nothing but the maximum value function. So maximum value function are also known as indirect objective or indirect objective function. Now what is the envelope theorem for unconstrained optimization? Say you have a function u is equal to f function of x y and a parameter um, phi so if you uh, the first order condition uh, is f x um, uh, is equal to f y equal to zero from that you solve it 
uh, you find the optimal values of x star and y star, which will be a function of phi. Uh, uh, x is star is a function of phi and y star is a function of phi. Now you put the value into the original utility function, you have v of phi to be function of uh, uh, f function of x of phi, y of phi, and also phi. So all are uh, re represented in the functions of phi. So uh, v phi is nothing but the maximum value function or the indirect objective of um, function because the optimum values of x star and y star are being put in this function. Similarly, if you have a profit function like this, you can take the first order condition that is pi L and pi K. And from that you find uh, setting those equal to zero, you can find L star and K star and L star and K star can be represented as functions of uh, the W, R and P. And if you put those in the profit function, uh, profit can also be represented as a function of W, R and P. So profit function is nothing but the indirect objective function here. So in case of unconstrained optimization, we have a thing like this. Now let us come to uh, what is the envelope theorem for constrained optimization. You have an additional constraint g x y phi that is equal to zero. So you have a utility function, you have a constraint, you put it in the Lagrange function, set the first order condition to be equal to zero, find the optimal values of x, y and lambda and put it into the utility function, you get the maximum value function v function of phi. Now the application of now the, from this you can we are asked to interpret what is the Lagrange multiplier. You see that L lambda, the Lagrange multiplier is nothing but fx by gx is equal to fy by gy. That is the ratio of the, um, the, the, the that is that gives us the condition that the slope of the level curve, that is the indifference curve, fx by fy is nothing but the slope of the constraint that is gx by gy at the optimum. Now, what is the duality and the envelope for the envelope theorem? If you have a primal problem like maximizing utility subject to the budget constraint, you set a um, 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 Lagrange uh, objective function z uh, u x y plus lambda b minus p x into x y and set the first order condition to be equal to zero. The the, the bundles that you are going to the optimum values of x y and lambda put m uh, over the top because xm ym actually denotes your ordinary demand bundle your ordinary demand function or your martialian demand function so maximum the, the value of xm and ym which are martialian demand bundles when you put it into the utility function you get the indirect utility function that is u star or you can convert it into v which is a function of px py and b now in case of the other just the opposite problem you have in the dual one you have you, your problem is now to minimize your expenditure subject to the utility constraint so you form a lagrange uh, and again set the partial derivatives for first order condition uh, to be equal to zero then the bundles now you derive x y and mu the new um, Lagrange multiply the values on the subscripted which is that H. H stands for the Hicksian demand function. You know Hicksian demand is nothing but the co compensated demand function. So if you have, if you are minimizing expenditure subject to the utility constraint, you have, when you put those values in the Px, Py, uh, Px into x plus Py into y, you get what is known as the expenditure function. So indirect utility function in case of uh, primal problem and the expenditure function in case of the dual problem. From this it follows there is a very important concept called the Roy's identity in consumer behavior. The, 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 the individual, the negative of the, the, the Marshallian uh, consumer, uh, uh, the Marshallian demand function can be expressed uh, as equal to the negative of the ratio of the two partial derivatives that is del V by del Px and del V by del B. And as we have, uh, you have just have the maximum value function to be expressed as V function of Px, Py and B. You start off with that one. You put the value of Marshallian demand bundle in the utility function and the constraint and try to set the power partial derivatives to be equal to zero. Now the, this partial derivative shows, and then, uh, uh, you find the first partial derivatives. You, you see from the first order condition that uh, the, the bracketed terms, the first bracketed term from the first order condition turns out to be equal to zero. So del V by del Px ultimately turns out to be minus lambda to the power m into xm and del v by del b turns out to be lambda m 
And if you take the ratio lambda n to the power m cancels out, and you, if you have you have x to the power m. Also, you have a Shepard lemma case where you have the uh, elaboration of the dual problem, and you try to uh, find the Hicksian demand bundle and uh, mu h. You put it in the expenditure function. You try to take the first partial derivative with, of e with respect to p x p y, and uh, you star. You find that they turns out to be equal to x h, y h, and mu h. These three partial derivatives are called uh, together called the Shepard's lemma in the consumer behavior theorem. Now, last but not the least, it's not possible to go on giving a lecture because um, uh, get tired at the end of uh, giving lecture for so many long time. So uh, I have to end somewhere. So let us uh, end with this. I told you that I will tell you uh, something about the Kuntakar conditions, and that is very very well written in uh, Chiang and Chiang and Wen Wright. And also I will refer to uh, you a book by which some students find it a little bit difficult. It's very well written in Henderson and Quant. If one can go through the uh, examples and uh, the derivations of Henderson and Quant, it may help them to understand it better. So you know that in a classical optimization problem, there is no explicit restriction on the sign of the choice variables and no inequality constraints are there. For relative um, um, extremum, what you do, you set the first partial derivative with a smooth Lagrange function and the choice variable and Lagrange multiplier to be equal to zero. But in case of nonlinear programming, you have a first order condition which looks similar to those conditions but a little bit difficult. Those conditions are uh, known in the names of two economists, uh, Kuhn and Tucker. They are known as Kuhn Tucker conditions. So you have the two things here. Step one is the non negativity restrictions. What are suppose you have a profit function pi is equal to a function of x1? The non negativity restriction means x1 cannot be negative. That means x1 greater than or equal to 0. If you have an n variable function pi is a function of x1, x2, comma, dot, dot, xn, the non negativity restriction says xj to be greater than or equal to 0 for all j varying from 1 to n. So, what is the first order condition? Fj less than or equal to 0, xj greater than or equal to 0, and xj into fj turns out to be equal to 0, where fj is nothing but the first partial derivative that is del pi by del xj. Now, how to go about? You suppose think of a, 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 a you are to maximize a profit function in the three variable case. Say pi is f x1, x2, x3, and you have two inequality constraints. You know the inequalities will be less than type g1 less than equal to r1, g2 less than equal to r2, and the non-negativity constraints x1, x2, x3 will be greater than equal to zero. So you convert them into an equality constraint by using two dummy variables x, s1 and s2, and set uh, the Lagrange, and you find the three conditions that are needed here is del z uh, dashed by del xj to be less than zero with xj greater than or equal to zero and xj into del z prime by del xj to be equal to zero del z prime by del si to be equal to, uh, less than or equal to zero with si greater than or equal to zero and si into del z prime by del si equal to zero and del z prime by del uh, lambda i to be equal to zero now you find that the, uh, in the uh, second and the third equations can be converted into a single equation. How to do? Now you find del z prime by del s i to be equal to minus lambda i and substituting it into the second line of the equation, you have minus lambda i to be less than zero, s i greater than zero and s i into lambda i. In place of del z prime by del s i, you put uh, lambda i because you have already proved it. It to be equal to minus lambda i to be equal to zero or equivalently you can write s i greater than zero lambda i greater than equal to s i and s i into lambda i to be zero and from the beginning you can see that you can write s i to be equal to r i minus g i so substituting it to the condition you have the two main equations that is del z prime by del x j is equal to f z minus lambda uh, lambda one uh, g, g j uh, one plus lambda two g j two less than or equal to zero and x j greater than or equal to zero and x j to del z uh, prime by del x j to be equal to zero and these two and three equals second and third equation combined together to be written in the form r i minus g i greater than or equal to zero with lambda i greater than zero and lambda i into that portion that is r i into g i to be equal to zero that vanishes up. This can also be derived. This can also be derived 
from uh, in an alternative manner just put it into the lagrange multiplier form set the uh, three things that is partial derivative zj by xj to be less than equal to zero but zj by lambda i to be greater than equal to zero impose the non negativity restriction uh, xj and lambda i and also requires the complementary surface property to prevail that is uh, that requires the product to vanish that if you put the conditions you get the values you get the same conditions as shown in the previous example now if you are going given a question they say minimize this subject to the constraint this you see the minimization and the constraints are greater than type and also you have a non negativity constraint x1 x2 greater than equal to 0 you put it in the lagrange fault multiplier and proceed the way i have just now shown and if you uh, can't do it you can take the help of chiang and when right this done in uh, page number 410 for your reference i have given it you can have a question of giving uh, putting uh, a simple question to maximize or to minimize uh, by the kuntakar uh, methods and find the optimum values of x1 and x2 you can proceed it as it's shown in this uh, example so i think i must stop here it's not possible to um, impart many things in one day because that will make things cumbersome and make my lecture uh, fruitless so uh, better to stop here and see the feedback of uh, uh, teachers and uh, students i am not familiar with this kind of lecture i don't know uh, whether this form of lecture would be helpful to you or not so uh, over to professor chatterji thank you thank you very much um it is true that on a subject like mathematical economics a very long lecture is not only difficult for the person who is delivering it but more difficult for the learners who are taking it and therefore rajiv has stopped just at the optimum level i believe uh for today his lecture has ended but i would like to have some responses from the students because the last thing which dr rajiv has asked that whether it has become beneficial to you so it is the students who may respond to this আমি জানি স্টুডেন্টদের খুবই সামনে পরীক্ষা পরীক্ষাটা এসে যাওয়াতে তাদের একটা টেনশনও আছে হয়তো আজকের এই ওয়েবিনার যদিও খুবই শেষের দিকে হচ্ছে তবু এখনো হাতে প্রায় এক মাস সময় আছে যতটুকু উনি বলেছেন তার থেকে তোমাদের যদি কোনো প্রশ্ন থাকে প্রাথমিকভাবে সেই প্রশ্নগুলো করো আমি টিচার্স যারা আছেন তাদের কাছে পরে যাচ্ছি তোমরা এই প্রশ্নগুলো করো আর তারপরে তোমরা স্টুডেন্টরা ডাউন দ্য লাইন সে আফটার ওয়ান উইক অর সো তোমরা যদি মনে করো যে আর একটা এমন ওয়েবিনার হলে তোমাদের আর একটু ভালো হবে তাহলে সেটা ভাবা যেতে পারে অবশ্যই স্যারের সময় এবং সুযোগ থাকলে তবেই কিন্তু এই মুহূর্তে তোমাদের কোনো প্রশ্ন থাকলে সেই প্রশ্নগুলো করো বা কেমন লেগেছে সেটা বলো তোমরা সাধারণত কথা বলো না তোমরা একটু চুপ করে না থেকে কথা বলো তিতাস কিছু বলবে হ্যাঁ বলো তিতাস নিজেকে আনমিউট করে কথা বলো তিতাস নীলেন্দু একটু কোয়ার্ডিনেট করো তিতাস কিছু বলবো আমি জানি না শুনতে পাওয়া যাচ্ছে না হ্যালো তিতাস স্যার আছেন তিতাস হাত তুললো তো তাহলে তো সাউন্ডটা খুব আসছে আসছে কিছু শুনতেই পাচ্ছি না হ্যালো সাউন্ডের একটা প্রবলেম হচ্ছে খুব আসছে ওই জন্য আমি করলাম হ্যাঁ ও আচ্ছা আচ্ছা সাউন্ড আপনি কিছু বলবেন না আমি এইটার জন্যই বলবো আমি না সাউন্ডটা প্রচন্ড আসছে
সাদিয়া কিছু বলতে চাও আজকাল স্টুডেন্টরা কথা বড্ড কম বলে দেখছি অনেকেই আছে সৌমজিৎ কিছু বলবে তোমরা যারা হাত তুলছ কথা বলো আমি জানি না টেকনিক্যাল কোনো ফল্ট হচ্ছে কিনা কথা আমরা শুনতে পাচ্ছি না এরকম নয় তো আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে স্যার দিস ইজ অনুশ্রী হ্যাঁ বলো ক্যান আই আস্ক আ কোশ্চেন ইয়েস অফ কোর্স স্যার অ্যাকচুয়ালি আই অ্যাম আ নন বেঙ্গলি and uh, okay, okay. yes uh, also actually there have been uh, classes conducted conducted in bengali in our college so most of the time i'm not able to understand some subjects but i also wanted to ask uh, do we have to practice from jayadev sarkhil as well i think it is a bengali writers book see the uh, today's sir rajiv sir yes sir has category men- categorically mention the what are the references you need to study where that name has not been spelled out yes so uh, I, uh, with your due permission can i say something yes yes of course uh see anushri uh, there is uh, see in my uh, total presentation i have not spoken a single word in bengali firstly because uh-huh. it is a formal it is a formal presentation and see Absolutely, sir. you you can, you can see there are two things what i want to stress is because uh, mostly students uh, are uh, um, actually i must not say misguided but they are not guided properly i must say because already references are spelled out in clearly explicitly in the syllabus of the university of calcutta and i have followed exactly this syllabus in toto the references where from you have to read each and every part minutely and categorically so if you go through the whole lecture you will see that most things are being covered from the parts which are actually referred to us by professor koshi gupta the the, the resource person from the calcutta university and uh, the other stalwarts who refer to us so those who are familiar with teaching they should not refer to other books which actually may look little bit easy and may provide everything in one piece but they are may not be good standard references quality references for preparation of these students because i hope some of you will be sitting for iti idea will be sitting for isi will be preparing for outside examination or going into academics for that i feel that quality references are very very important compared to other kinds of non standard references which you are asking for i hope i have given your answer anushree yes sir, sir definitely you. thank you thank you also to what difficulty level we should practice the sums see there is no shortcut route to if i have presented this that in case of other subjects as you have in indian economics or development or micro or macro these things will come in the exam those things will come these parts there is no no surety that these parts will come But these are concepts which if you don't understand you will not be able to solve the problems which are given in the exam so if you don't understand the very basics and i tell you i have taken a great toll a great pain to prepare these slides because it is known to sir and professor nilendu chatterji that it is not easy to get those things and prepare the slides uh, from the books and texts as i have done it because there is no ready slide preparation available there so it's yes. a challenge also for me 
and if anyone wants any help from me the email and my phone number is there with professor nilendu chatterjee and professor tilak chatterjee he or she may feel free to contact me uh, any uh, at any moment uh, can mail me i will definitely respond to the queries i will try to solve the queries thank you so much sir. thank you so much. okay welcome we will forward it this pdf right i will i will try i will try to give it to uh, professor chatterjee so that they may do uh, they have a recording and they will also probably give you the youtube also and if you need any further help you can contact me no problem at all thank you so students. much and if there are some students who are hesitant to speak in because i have no problems i belong to uh, st xavier's college once and i had the um mane uh, uh, ex being an ex severian i have no problem speaking hours and hours in english but there may be some students who are feeling shy as professor chatterjee has told that you may not be understanding english as maybe may not be speaking bengali but there are some students who are feeling shy not to speak uh, english in such a such fluently they may ask the questions in bengali also i have no problems at all but you try to get references and get your preparations in such a manner that you follow quality texts that is my suggestion ami ektu boli chhatro chhatrider uddeshye ami manushta na khub soja khub soja kore ekti kotha chhatro chhatrider bolchi dekho tumra amader santaner moton kono rokom sankoch rekho na kichu din pore porikha etai bodhay shesh sujog যেখানে তোমাদের কোনো মনের ডাউট থাকলে হয়তো আজকেই প্রশ্ন করার মতন তুমি কিছু খুঁজে পাচ্ছ না কিন্তু এই রকমও যদি মনের অনুভূতি হয় যে হ্যাঁ এখনো তো অনেক কিছু জানতে হবে এখনো তো অনেক কিছু বুঝতে হবে মাইসেলফ এবং নীলেন্দু স্যার আমরা আজকের এই ওয়েবিনারের ভিডিও রেকর্ডিংটা অবশ্যই একটু প্রস্তুত করতে হয় গোছাতে হয় করে তোমাদের দিয়ে দেবো আমি যেটা তোমাদের এবং উনি যে পিপিটিটা দিয়েছেন সেটাও তোমাদের উনি যদি প্রোভাইড করেন সেটাও তোমাদের কাছে পাস অন করব উনি প্রচুর পরিশ্রম করে তবে এইরকম একটা পিপিটি তৈরি করেছেন তো দ্যাট উইল বি হেল্পফুল টু ইউ কিন্তু রাজীব স্যার যতই হেল্প করার চেষ্টা করুন ইলেন্দু স্যার যতই অর্গানাইজ করে হেল্প করার চেষ্টা করুন যতক্ষণ না তুমি তোমাকে হেল্প করবে ততক্ষণ কিন্তু তোমার সাহায্য হবে না এবং তোমাকে যদি তোমাকে হেল্প করতে হয় তাহলে কিন্তু প্লিজ ইন্টারাক্ট মাথায় ভাবো মনে প্রশ্ন আনো প্রশ্ন করো রাজীব স্যার সামনে আছেন সেই প্রশ্নের উত্তর যদি উনি দেন তবেই তো তোমার উপকার চুপ করে বসে থাকতে নেই সেমিনারের শেষে ইন্টারাকশনের টাইম রাখা হয় এটা শুধু এখানে নয় সারা পৃথিবীতেই সেমিনার হয় চল্লিশ মিনিট পঁয়তাল্লিশ মিনিট তারপরে এক ঘন্টা টাইম রাখা হয় ইন্টারাকশনের জন্য তোমরা যদি ইন্টারাক্ট না করো তাহলে আজকের ওয়েবিনার এখানেই শেষ আমি তোমাদের কাছে জানতে চাইবো যে তোমাদের প্রশ্ন করার থাকলে তোমরা প্রশ্ন এখন করবে কি না যদি তোমাদের প্রশ্ন না থাকে বা যেটা প্রফেসর রাজীব বললেন যে ইউ মে ফিল শাই ইউ ক্যান স্পিক ইন এনি ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ আরে বাবা ইংরাজি ভাষাটা নিয়ে আমরা জন্মগতভাবে মানে আমরা জন্মাইনি আমরা ওটা আমাদের অ্যাকোয়ার্ড ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ না পারলে কি আছে যা ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল ইকোনমিক্সটা বোঝার জন্য ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজটা তো ইম্পর্টেন্ট নয় তুমি তোমার প্রশ্নটা করবে যে কোনো ভাষায় যেমন শ্রুতির একটা প্রবলেম ছিল Uh, I'm sorry to Shruti, je, uh, I was speaking in Bengali also. In the, the person who has delivered the lecture, he I think uh, he has made all the doubts uh, clear. So now it's your turn to raise questions. Or Nilendu may think of, no, there are some teachers. I mean, কিছুক্ষণ আগেও দেখছিলাম অনেক টিচার্স আছেন তাদের মধ্যে থেকে কারোর কিছু বলার থাকে থাকলে আপনারাও বলতে পারেন বা বলুন আমি চাইবো আপনার একটু বলুন যেটা ছাত্র ছাত্রীদেরকে আর একটু ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল ইকোনমিক্স পড়ার ক্ষেত্রে উৎসাহিত করবে ডেফিনেটলি এটা তো এই এই ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল ইকোনমিক্স এইরকম ওয়েবিনারে বসে ডেলিভার করা খুব যে সহজ তা তো নয় যখন প্রফেসর রাজীব বলে যাচ্ছিলেন ড ড ড ততটা সঙ্গে সঙ্গে তো ফার্স্ট আমাদের মাথাতেও সেটা কনসেপচুয়ালাইজ করতে হচ্ছিল তো ইট ইস ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট ব্ল্যাক বোর্ড ছাড়া অনেক কিছু হয় না তার মধ্যে অবশ্যই ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল ইকোনমিক ব্ল্যাক বোর্ড ছাড়া হওয়ানো সত্যি খুব কঠিন তো সেখানে এত ফার্স্ট একই দিনে দুটো ইউনিট বলতে যাওয়া ইজ ভেরি 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 ডিফিকাল্ট তবু উনি সাহস করে প্রচুর পরিশ্রম করেছেন বোঝা যাচ্ছে করে তোমাদের সাহায্য করার চেষ্টা করেছে 
এখন তোমরা একটু তোমাদের নিজেদের সাহায্য করে মনে প্রশ্ন থাকলে জিজ্ঞেস করো স্যার বা ম্যাডাম যারা আছেন বিভিন্ন কলেজ থেকে আপনারাও কিছু কথা বললে ছেলেমেয়েরা যদি উপকৃত হয় উৎসাহিত হয় আপনারা কাইন্ডলি করুন আচ্ছা আমি পারমিতা বলছি শ্রী শিক্ষায়তন কলেজ থেকে শোনা যাচ্ছে হ্যাঁ বলুন আমার আমার প্রশ্ন কিছু নেই কিন্তু মানে রাজীব দাকে হার্ট ফেল থ্যাঙ্কস মানে ভেরি কমেন্ডেবল মানে আমরা তো পড়াই এই পেপারটা এতটুকু সময়ের মধ্যে এই কথাগুলো শোনার জন্যই মানে কথাগুলো শোনার জন্যই সেমিনারটা সেখানে ছোট ছোট ডাউট গুলো ক্লিয়ার হয়ে যায় আমিও অপেক্ষা করছিলাম যদি স্টুডেন্টরা কেউ কিছু বলে কারণ আমি প্রথম থেকে মানে যেই মুহূর্তে আপনি মানে কি বলবো মানে একটা একটা করে টপিক এগিয়ে যাচ্ছেন জায়গায় <laughs> বলেছি অনেক কিছু ইয়ে করেছি সবই হচ্ছে অন্য ধরনের বিষয় করোনা প্যান্ডেমিক এবং অন্যান্য মানে রিসার্চ লেভেলের কিছু দিল্লি ইউনিভার্সিটিতে কিন্তু রিগার্ডিং ইউনিভার্সিটি সিলেবাস অফ ক্যালকাটা ইউনিভার্সিটি এই রকম ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল ইকোনমিক্স এটা আমিও এই নীলেন্দু চ্যাটার্জি বলার পর আমি রিয়েলি এটাকে চ্যালেঞ্জ হিসেবে নিয়েছিলাম লেটাস লেটাস সি ওয়েদার আই ক্যান ডু ইট মানে ইটস বোর্ড ওয়ার্ক স্যার যেটা বললেন বোর্ড ওয়ার্ক ছাড়া ম্যাথামেটিক্স after a very good innings being played in front of the huge capacity crowd ar amar ar notun kore ki bolar ache ami asha korbo agami dineo ashole ami ajker jini resource person ba ajker jini sir takei bolchi ei dhoroner effort amra pandemic er ager thekei shuru korechilam তখন ফিজিক্যালি হয়েছিল যাদবপুর ইউনিভার্সিটিতে একটা বড় অডিটোরিয়াম নিয়ে সেখানেও প্রায় একশো পঁয়তাল্লিশ জন একশো সত্তর জন মতন অ্যাটেন্ড করেছিলেন কিছু টিচারও অ্যাটেন্ড করেছিলেন তো সেখানে মনে আছে কৌশিক গুপ্ত স্যার যখনই প্রয়োজন হচ্ছিল বোর্ডে চলে যাচ্ছিলেন রঞ্জন স্যারের যখনই প্রয়োজন হচ্ছিল বোর্ডে চলে যাচ্ছিলেন তো এখানে তো সেই সুযোগটা হচ্ছে না সেই জন্যই মনে হয় যে এটা খুবই একটা খুবই ডিফিকাল্ট টাস্ক কিন্তু স্টেল পরিশ্রমটা বোঝা গিয়েছে যে এতটা মেটিকুলাস ভাবে পাওয়ার পয়েন্টে সমস্ত সাজিয়ে আনা আমরাও তো কোনো না কোনো পর্যায়ে উই অলসো মানে আজ আমি হয়তো প্রিন্সিপাল কিন্তু একদিনে তো আর প্রিন্সিপাল হয়নি টিচার তো ছিলামই ফলে একটা পাওয়ার পয়েন্ট প্রেজেন্টেশন করে প্রেজেন্ট করা কিন্তু যেখানে ফিজিক্যালি প্রেজেন্ট সেখানে পাওয়ার পয়েন্ট প্রেজেন্টেশনটা না মাছ মাছ ইজিয়ার এখানে নিজের প্রেজেন্টেশন নিজে দেখে নিজে বলছি কারোর রেসপন্স বুঝতে পারছি না সেখানে খুব ডিফিকাল্ট খুবই ডিফিকাল্ট মানে নির্বাক চলচ্চিত্র একরকম হয় কিন্তু নির্বাক শ্রোতা আসে পারফর্ম করা ইজ রিয়েলি ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট বাট স্টিল এই দেড় ঘন্টা ধরে ছেলেমেয়েরা প্রায় ষাটজন মতন ছেলেমেয়ে কনস্ট্যান্টলি শুনেছেন টিচাররাও অনেকে ছিলেন আমি জানি না নীলাভ এখানে প্রেজেন্ট আছে 
না নীলাবো লেফট করেছে আচ্ছা নীলাবো লেফট করেছে আমি আমি নাম দেখে অন্তত সবাইকে চিনতে পাচ্ছি না যদি কোনো টিচারের কিছু বলার থাকে আপনারা বলুন আর তা না হলে নীলেন্দু ইউ মে এন দ্য প্রোগ্রাম আর রাজীব মেনি মেনি থ্যাঙ্কস টু ইউ এত অল্প সময়ের মধ্যে ইউ হ্যাভ রেসপন্ডেড টু আওয়ার কল এই প্রথমবার ধরলাম এরপরও আর ছাড়বো না আরো ধরবো ঠিক আছে ঠিক আছে দেখছি <laughs> ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच राजीव सर फॉर दिस वेबिनार फॉर एग्रीइंग टू फॉर काइंडली एग्रीइंग टू गिव योर लेक्चर इन दिस वेबिनार वी हैव रिकॉर्डेड द मीटिंग एंड इट विल बी अपलोडेड ऑन आवर YouTube चैनल आवर ऑफिशियल कॉलेज YouTube चैनल इट विल बी अपलोडेड देयर एंड द लिंक विल बी गिवन इन द ग्रुप Uh, just one thing rajiv sir will you be able to give the powerpoint because the students always ask for the powerpoint i am i am out of pdf kore share kore debo okay sir no problem i pdf kore share kore no problem so on that note thank you very much all the participants our principal sir and rajiv sir and we here by call it a day thank you sir okay. Thank you teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.